wants to give you a big picture view so you can hopefully place the different stories that you hear into a context. Now the story of totality is often told in a rather sort of narrow kind of way. And the story is said to be that the Māori were the poor victims of the white man who came, who was the perpetrator of a great evil. And there's some truth to that. But history is usually a lot more complex. And I want to suggest to you as a starting illustration that there were five key groups that you have to know about. The first at the centre of a stage, if you can imagine it, are the Māori. They are the tangata whenua, the people of the land, right here in the centre. The next on the stage were whalers, sailors and traders. Now they had come from afar on their ships looking for money. Bring me the money is their chant. And they were right off to the side of the stage because they weren't here for the well-being of Māori, didn't really care about them, didn't want any trouble, just the whales, the seals, the trades, anything else they could make money from. The next on the stage, you've got Māori now, you've got the whalers, sealers and traders. The next on the stage was the missionaries. Now the missionaries came here from a genuine motive to help and serve Māori. They were the ones who were passionately interested in trying to understand a different language and culture to relate to Māori to bring a message of hope and an improvement of life. Even though they made mistakes, like everybody on the stage did, they would be standing right at the centre next to Māori to help them. The fourth on the stage were the settlers. Now the settlers came here at the promise of land and a better life. The Māori, tangata whenua, people of the land, the whalers, sealers and traders, bring me the money. The missionaries, we're here to help, and the settlers, I'm here for a better life. Again, not really interested in the Māori. Here, for, simply for the better life, promised them in the glossy brochures that were selling land for cheap in New Zealand, coming out on ships from England. The fifth party to come on the stage, then, is the colonial office. And now you have a fuller picture. The colonial office is the British leadership. And they've come across, and because Britain is the superpower of the world at this point in time, they genuinely have power to decide who's going to win. And it is because of the missionaries who get a hold of the colonial office and bring them standing next to Māori that we have Tatiriti or Waitangi, the Treaty of Waitangi. However, the tragedy of the story is that the settlers managed to capture the heart of the crown pretty quickly. And so once the treaty was signed, within even just a couple of years, the uh, New Zealand company, who were buying and selling land from Māori, selling it on for cheap, uh, had become the land purchasing agents for the Crown. And the Crown, the government, began to align itself with the interests of the foreign settlers more so than Māori across the next number of decades, and in fact over the next 130, 150 years. And uh, that summarises the context of totality. To take you right back to give you some of the pieces of this story. Captain Cook discovered New Zealand in around about 1769. Of course he wasn't the first to discover it, there had been people who had discovered it prior from probably a few places, but it's of note certainly Māori had discovered it earlier and had in fact moved here to inhabit the land. An interesting story is told of a young boy, five years old, named Patawone. And his dad actually went out on a walker and threw some fish onto Captain Cook's ship and had some conversation with him and received some gifts right back on that first visit. Uh, it was up in Northland. And he came back to the shore and Patawone saw these amazing gifts, some blankets. I'm not sure if there was tobacco, like cigarettes involved, but there was pork involved. And it's uh, commented that that was his first taste of pork as a five-year-old. And we'll come back to more on Patawane later. If you jump forward a number of years, the whalers, sealers and traders then come and begin their trade. And Māori liked this because they had opportunity to get new products and new things. It worked well for them. And of course they were the vast majority here. They still controlled this land. As they travelled abroad though, they discovered a world far bigger uh, than they could ever have comprehended existed. And some significant connections were made on these travels. One of them was by a chief named Te Pahi. This would have been early in the 1800s. He went to Australia to meet Governor King to negotiate better trade agreements because they were already having trouble with these Pākehā there amongst the whalers, sealers and traders, breaking laws. In fact, there were murderings and all sorts of things that were uh, going on. It was on this trip that he met the Reverend Samuel Marsden. Now the Reverend Samuel Marsden would love to have set up a mission station in New Zealand to try and serve Māori, that was his motive, but he wouldn't come here until he was invited. They became great friends and eventually Te Pahi said, 
You're different to all these other Europeans that we're connecting with. You seem to be entirely about trying to help us rather than simply trade for your own benefit. I'd like you to come and set up a mission station in New Zealand. We need to hear your message and to engage with you. Tragically, Te Pahi was killed a little while later. There was a ship, in fact, that was attacked and most people on it killed. The ship was called the Boyd. This was done by a chief named Te Puhi. Some of the whalers and sealers misunderstood this as being a chief named Te Pahi, and so they raided his village and he died as a result of injuries received. It fell then to his nephew who decided to travel to England and his name was Ruatara. He believed that King George would love to meet a, uh, a chief of his standing, but he was a young chief and didn't have his moko, his tattoos, yet across his face. He worked on the ship to pay his wages to get himself across to England. But when he reached there intending to see the king, the ship's captain laughed at him, just thinking of a foolish young mouldy boy, and didn't allow him even off the ship. He was in fact locked in the bowels of the ship where he became sick with a sickness called tuberculosis where you cough up blood and it damages your lungs. And so eventually struggling to find a way to get rid of this nuisance young mouldy boy that they had with them, they found a ship called the Anne and he was placed on that to be taken back to Australia. And who should turn out to be on that same ship? The Reverend Samuel Marsden and his wife. Upon discovering Ruatara, he took him back to his own cabin where they nursed him back to health. He was so sick that he needed to stay at their house in Parramatta, Sydney for about another seven months recuperating. And during this time, Marston continued to learn Te Reo Māori and, and had his own written version of it. And he began to teach Ruatara all these new things that he, he wouldn't have known yet. The farming of new crops like wheat and maize. Uh, different types of fruit trees that they'd never seen before. Uh, how to look after sheep and cows and other types of animals. And so when it came time for Ruatara to return, Marston gifted him uh, seeds for these new crops and um, as well as animals, uh, various things to come back to New Zealand. Now those things were stolen by the captain of the ship Ruatara was placed upon. In fact, he was dumped on an island with somebody, another Māori, and uh, they had to kill seals to feed themselves till they waved down another ship and found their way back to New Zealand. But this led to Ruatara extending an invitation to Marsden, and in 1814, Marsden brought three families over, called the Kings, the Kendalls and the Halls. 1814 the first invited Pākehā settlement in New Zealand. This was at a place called Oihi Bay, next to Rangihaua Pā, 30 minutes north of Kerikeri in Northland. And it is also on that occasion that on the first Sunday, it just happened to be the 25th December, which of course is Christmas Day. And so Marsden was invited to preach, and Ruatara gathered a crowd of three or four hundred Māori who listened to the message but didn't really understand what it was all about and performed a haka that's still remembered to this day in celebration of this amazing message of peace and love that was brought. For the next chapter, Christianity wasn't embraced very quickly by Māori. In fact, you wait about a dozen years before the first Māori embraced the Christian faith and his name uh, was Christian Arangi. It's sometimes said that the missionaries were only interested in getting converts for their religion and nothing else. This wasn't true in New Zealand's history. In fact, the opposite was the case. Marston was criticised for leading a mission that failed to preach the Christian message very often. He was interested instead in trying to help Māori in practical ways to build bridges of trust and relationship. As already noted, out of his own pocket, at his own expense, he ended up buying a ship so that things he gifted to Māori couldn't be stolen anymore. And that enabled the New Zealand mission. That ship was called the Active. And then he gifted horses, he gifted, um, he would have gifted pigs, I know he gifted sheep to have the first flocks of sheep here, he gifted cows so they could breed them and they could get milk, uh, he gifted the crops like wheat and maize and all manner of fruit trees. But also he discovered that Māori had all these trees but had no metal tools, so carpentry ability was very limited. So he gifted tools and taught carpentry to Māori, but then he also had to teach blacksmithing so they knew how to fix and to make metal tools, as an example. And so there were a myriad of trades that he and the other missionaries who were living here with their families devoted themselves to trying to share with Māori. But it was an incredibly violent society. There were a lot of superstitions. Um, you'll hear many stories, and most of them are true and probably worse. That was the nature of a, f a feudal, that's a fighting, tribal society. 
Uh, battles were regular. There was human sacrifice. There was infanticide, the killing of babies. There was cannibalism, all manner of things, as can also be found in most of our cultures if you go far enough back. It wasn't until Henry Williams arrived in about 1826 that things began to change. He'd been in war in Europe. He'd been, in fact, uh, in the Navy, and he'd been involved in what's called the Napoleonic Wars. And he'd seen enough fighting for a couple of lifetimes. It's rumoured he might have been a pacifist. That means he didn't believe any more in fighting. And then he came to try and do good here in New Zealand as a missionary. As a result, he was fearless because he'd already faced death many times. And here he was, still having survived and alive. He looked at New Zealand and the superstitions and the fear and the war amongst Māori and the loss of life. And he said, wait a minute, we have this Christian faith and belief that instead of the world being random with good and bad gods, that the God who is above everything is a loving and good God who calls us to, to love others and to be good. And therefore not to fight, uh, but to be kind and generous and hospitable. We need to talk about this God who revealed himself through Jesus. Maybe that can affect the heart. Maybe that can bring hope and change. So he began to speak the Christian message clearly. And as Māori heard it, they began to embrace it. The story is told of a young girl named Tarore. Her father was Ngākuku and he took her and others over a hill for safety into the uh, Bay of Plenty from the Waikato because they knew a raiding party was about to come their way. As they lit a campfire at night, the smoke was seen by a raiding party from Rotorua who came across and raided them at night. And as everyone fled into the bush, Tarore was caught and she was killed. Now Ngākuku had embraced the Christian faith and he had a copy of the Gospel of Luke in Te Reo Māori. And this was taken across to Rotorua. Ngākuku declared to his people, you want me to get revenge and go and fight, but we've done that for generations. How about we choose to forgive like Jesus, the teacher in Christianity, taught us to do? Meanwhile in Rotorua, someone arrived from Northland, a slave who'd been released, because Christians were saying we should release slaves, slavery is wrong. He was able to read Te Reo Māori, and then upon hearing the Christian message, the chief became convinced that he should say sorry for having murdered Ngākuku's daughter, Tarore. And so he comes across to meet her, his men expecting he would be killed, and the two men embrace and forgive each other. Now this story and other stories like it begin to go throughout the land as Māori begin to embrace the Christian faith and the ways of peace instead of the ways of superstition and war. Down in the Kapiti coast near Wellington, Te Raupraha is a great warring chief. His son is named Katu and his cousin is named Tafifi. They hear the Christian message and decide to become Christians. But they want some copies of the, the Bible to understand the story better. Well, a slave released from Northland named Mataho, and also called Ripaho, comes down there and they're talking and he says, I know where there's a copy of some of the New Testament scriptures in Te Reo Māori up at Rotorua, so he'd clearly been there. So men went up and they came back with the Gospel of Luke, and guess whose name was written in front of it? It was Ngākuku. Uh, Ngākuku's Gospel of Luke still there. And this was read down in the Kapiti coast, and Kasu and Tafifi, having embraced the Christian faith, decided we're going to stop the fighting and the war. Now they'd been a part of plundering and killing and dominating Māori around the Upper South Island, around Nelson and right down as far as Kaikoura. So, with uh, a bit of dismay from his father, Te Raupraha, Katu and Tafifi went on a peacemaking trip. And they went and spread the same message again. And so the Christian message spread. It's reported that one sailor going down the west coast of the South Island, near Westport and Greymouth, pulled in to get water uh, from some rivers. And he came back to the ship saying that surely every Māori he met was thoroughly Christian. It was Māori who spread the message themselves amongst their people, and established an expression of Christianity in their language and within their culture, quite separate to and ahead of the missionaries. This created a scenario ready for the next chapter of the story. And this is about two different groups that therefore begin to come together. On the one hand, you're going to have uh, what's called Te Waka Mininga, the Confederation of Northland Chiefs. And on the other hand, you're going to have this humanitarian, that's human loving and caring Christian movement out of England, that wants to try and change the way England treats others. You see, Northland chiefs, starting from Te Pahi, are dealing with whalers, sealers and traders. How are they going to manage them? 
Well, instead of fighting each other, they could start trading with the whalers, sealers, and traders. But then they decided to meet, I believe it was every spring, and the chiefs would come together. This was called Te Wakami Nenga, the Confederation of the Chiefs. And they would come together to discuss how they would manage the Pākehā who were now living amongst them. As this group grew in unity, it was uh, discussed with them by Busby, I'll come back to, to Busby, and by missionaries and others, that there could be benefit in them declaring New Zealand a sovereign nation. That means an independent nation, not just with independent tribes who were in charge of themselves, but together as one whole nation. And so, having requested help from Britain to deal with the bad behaviour of Pākehā, about 15 years later, around um, 1831, in 1835, they signed what was called the Declaration of Independence, or He Whakaputanga, and they declared New Zealand a sovereign nation underneath Māori leadership. This provided a context for a treaty, because England could no longer just come and take New Zealand. It was a sovereign nation, uh, and if they were to come here, it would have to be in an agreement with Māori. They weren't just tribes spread out and separated. They were trying to say, we're becoming one united people. Now, at the same time in England, uh, England, as I've mentioned, was the superpower of the world. Now, slavery was standard in pretty much every culture and country across the globe for the past however many thousand years. But a man stood up named William Wilberforce, and he went into Parliament and he said, I think slavery is wrong, and we should stop the slave trade, and in fact, even one day, release all of our slaves. This was a crazy idea, but in 1807, they succeeded in stopping the slave trade. Uh, which would have gone across to Africa with ships. You'd go with your weapons and collect a whole lot of men, women and children, bind them in chains, put them in the bow of the ship and take them someplace like America or somewhere else to sell them. It's reported one third of all people uh, who were slaves in those ships died on the voyage. Uh, it was terrible, terrible conditions. With the confidence of having stopped the slave trade, a group of them, together with William Wilberforce at a place called Clapham, Clapham, they're called the Clapham Sect or the Clapham Group in England, thought, if we can do this, we can change the world. They started more than 230 societies to try and change the world. But when they looked at colonisation, people from England taking over other countries, people from France did the same, the Dutch did the same, the Spanish did the same, they said, wait a minute. If we take up the land off the Aboriginals of Australia, or the, the Native Indians of America, or the Māori of New Zealand, isn't that a bit like slavery, making slaves of them on their land which we've ripped out from under their feet? I'm not sure I like that. So they, in their idealism, and their dreams, thought, I wonder if we could spare a nation or two from being colonised by our country. Becoming involved in politics, um, you end up with guys like Lord Glenelg, and he was in there with this kind of thinking, in the colonial office, trying to stop England colonising other nations. But it was in that same period of He Whakaputanga that a man named Edward Gibbon Wakefield came along and said, New Zealand would make a great property development. I wonder if I could buy a whole lot of that for, you know, a few blankets and a few smokes. And uh, then I could sell it on to people who don't have homes to live in here in England, who can pay me money to sail around the world, get land for cheap, I make money, they get new land, and all that unused land in New Zealand is now being used for a good purpose. Well, Lord Glenelg was horrified. But this idea from Wakefield was allowed. A law was passed in 1836, opening New Zealand for limited colonisation. And so they began to think, how do we stop this? How can we protect the Māori from being colonised? You jump forward a couple of years, and they found a really tough man from the Navy who never compromised. And his name was Hobson. He became Governor Hobson. He was sent to check out what was happening in New Zealand, sailing halfway around the world and then back. He said, it's pretty bad what's happening to Māori. And so they commissioned him to try and make a treaty with Māori with the hope of protecting them. And the words for this came from two key people. One was from Lord Normanby and the other was from a guy, James Stevens, who was the nephew of William Wilberforce. At the crux of it, from, from Lord Normanby, he said, Hobson, here's your job. We want you to take a ship ride across to New Zealand to make a treaty with the Māori. But here it is. Your, your mission is to try and stop this disaster of colonisation. But if not possible, you need to mitigate it. And that word means to soften it. Try and stop the disaster coming to Māori. And so, he hops on the ship and he comes over. And uh, 
When he reaches here, he comes on shore and he comes to meet with James Busby, who's been appointed from England as a connection point for communication, I guess. And uh, he shows him the papers of this proposed agreement. And Busby's pretty excited. Instead of coming to take the land and colonise New Zealand, the goal is to have an agreement that will actually protect something of the rights of Māori. And what needs to be understood is that ships were already on the sea at that point in time with the first couple of thousand settlers coming to New Zealand to get land and build their new life. They couldn't stop people coming. So how could they limit the damage from lots of Europeans coming here to New Zealand? And so we come to the next chapter of it. And in this next chapter, you have a treaty meeting. Hobson becomes sick. A invitation is created and sent out to Māori around the region. There's a man arrived from England who wants to be governor over both them and us was the invitation. And so Māori chiefs came in, but because Hobson is sick, the treaty isn't actually written, it's just a whole lot of notes. Busby therefore gets those notes and writes it on the night before the, um, the discussions. It's given across to Henry Williams and his son to translate into Te Reo Māori. And a whole lot of chiefs gather for a hui. And at this hui, they discuss the treaty. Now, some chiefs stand up like Kafati, and he says, What? You want to propose that you become governor, and you go up, 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 and me, the great chief, goes down, down, down? Well, I tell you, no, 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 I shall not have it. Because the proposal was one government given to the British crown overall. But the second article of the treaty was that Māori would be protected. In fact, specifically, their lands, their villages, and their treasures would be protected. And thirdly, they would be afforded equal rights with British citizens, which in the Te Reo Māori translation of the treaty talks about both the privileges and the responsibilities or duties of citizenship. Well, the debates carry on, and on the next day, to cut a long story short, the chiefs one by one come up and they sign. Not all willingly at first, not all entirely happily, but they sign. And then Hobson takes that... Um, treaty and he goes off to the Hokianga further up north and it's presented again to another gathering of chiefs and so it continues. The interesting thing to note here is that the relationship was significantly and primarily bridged by the missionaries. Māori trusted the missionaries, they knew they'd come here to try and serve and help even if everything they did wasn't perfect. In contrast everybody else was here on the stage for themselves, the whalers, sealers and traders, and the uh, settlers on the other side, if you remember our illustration. You might remember from the start of my story, a five-year-old boy sitting at the beach when Captain Cook arrives and his dad goes out to meet him. His name was Patawone. Patawone signs that treaty, as does his brother Wakanene. They're both great warring chiefs of Northland now, and Patawone, so you know, is 76 years of age. To jump forward, to finish the story reasonably quickly now. We head into what is the tragic part of the story, and this is the betrayal. An agreement has been made between Māori and Pākehā in good faith. An agreement you could say that is under God. It's an, ag an agreement made on the basis of trust. Yes, there'll be one government now for all people, but Māori's land, villages and treasures are going to be protected and they will be equal citizens. But tragically, the government, the Crown, within two years appoints that New Zealand company with uh, Wakefield as the land purchasing agents for the Crown. They had unjustly already purchased so much land in New Zealand for hardly anything. Whereas Māori were being caught out because they would sell land thinking that you were lending it and it would come back to you when it had finished being used. You see, to Māori you couldn't own land because the land's here before you're born and it's here when you die. How could you own land? And so many were actually dispossessed of their land early on and pretty unhappy about it. There were also significant changes in population. There were by about this time 55,000 Māori across New Zealand. Many had died from the flu. Many had died also from the uh, Māori uh, wars fighting against each other once they had muskets and, and felt a bit more power to do so. But the number of Pākehā here was about 2,000 in um, 1840 when the treaty was signed, within five years it was 12,500. If you jump on another 10 years, it got up to about 50,000. Another 10 years, 250,000. 
In another 10 years, it was up to half a million Pākehā, or Europeans here. And the number of Māori from this point stayed around about that 50 to 55,000 mark. Governors were appointed who really didn't listen. Governor Brown, Governor Gray. They served the interests of the settlers, they forgot about Māori, and they betrayed the treaty. One of the early uh, signs of people Māori being upset was a short few years after the treaty, Horne Heke went to a flagpole that had the British flag on it, and he chopped it down because it was his pole. And he was like, I'm not happy with this treaty that we signed. He kind of had buyer's regret. But so many things had changed so fast, he was no longer trusting the British Crown would, in fact, be honest and follow it through. He had become friends with some Americans who had thrown the British out. He actually sailed his own ships at that time under the American flag. Uh, and there were beginning to be suspicions that things were going to go wrong. You come through to 1860 and 61, and Winamukingi Tarangataki, he's from Taranaki near New Plymouth, uh, Waitara. They're living down the Kapiti coast near Waikanae, near Wellington at that point in time. A younger chief, or a lower chief, sells some of his land in Waitara. He says, you can't sell my land, I'm the, I'm the chief of the area. And so he goes back to occupy his land. You've got an amazing missionary named Oct Octavius Hadfield there, trying to support him as well. No one thinks that Governor Brown will attack them at Waitara because Clearly the chief is the one in charge of the land. You can't sell land without the chief agreeing. But Brown attacks, and Brown takes that land. Uh, Wurumu Kingi Tarangataki had lost 60,000 uh, um, acres, I think it was. Might have been hectares earlier on. They had preserved this land down by the sea for the orphan and the widow. It was a place that was fertile to grow crops for those who were poor. And now the crown had come in and taken even this. This was the beginning of the land wars. And the land wars spread through to the Waikato, the land wars spread on through to the Bay of Plenty. In the Waikato, maybe uh, near to Matamata, you've got a place called Waharoa, named after the great warring chief Te Waharoa. And he had a son named Tarapipipi, later became known as um, uh, Wurumu Tamihana, Tarapipipi Waharoa. And Tarapipipi Waharoa became a Christian. He committed to the ways of peace and he wouldn't fight. But then the British started to build a road from Auckland into the Waikato. Hold on a minute, you don't own any land. How can you build a road? And so some Māori began to fight to stop the road. And Tarapipi says, I'm a Christian. I'm not going to fight. And so he stays out of the battle. But the battle line comes closer and closer to him. As it gets very near to where he's living, uh, him and his people, under God's laws, trying to do what's right and good, they send some women and children to a village. So they're away from the fighting for protection. Well, the British troops arrive there and burn the huts down with the women and children inside. Not knowing what to do, he thinks, I'd better pick up the musket and fight. I've got to defend my people, surely. He fights but realises you can't beat the British. They're the global superpower. They can send ship after ship with soldier after soldier and weapon after weapon. And so he eventually lays down his musket and he makes peace and he loses all of his lands as a consequence for ever having stood against the British. A similar pattern takes place in the Bay of Plenty. The hurt runs deep. And this hurt continues. The land wars finished in 1872. Do you remember that five-year-old boy by the beach at the very beginning when Captain Cook arrived? He was 76 years of age when the treaty is signed. He died in the year the land wars ended, 1872. And he was 108 years old. Patuone, the chief, lived to be 108. And uh, you get a decade later, you've got the story of Parihaka, which I'm sure you'll look at sometime. But the loss of land continues. You go through to the 1890s, and decisions have been made that children in schools aren't allowed to speak te reo Māori. Prior to that, decisions have been made that Māori schools, because Māori had started their own schools to teach their own children uh, how to read and write, etc., aren't allowed to speak in Māori. And so, by the time you're in the 1890s, if a Māori child used any word in, in Te Reo Māori, uh, they would actually get the cane as a punishment for saying anything in Māori. Only English was allowed. See, the loss of land continued. In, 18, sorry, in 1925, the Public Lands Act gave the government the right to simply take any land from Māori that they wanted if it was needed for public works, which means roads and power lines and these sorts of things. So I need to put a road through here, so I will take that land and this whole valley up to that hill over there, and that hill over there. By all sorts of means, Māori kept losing their lands through the 2010s and 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s. 100 and, 
30 years after the treaty was signed is where things began to turn. Apirana Ngata had been a great politician, a Māori uh, MP in the early 1900s, and he'd advocated for a change in viewpoint toward Māori. And public viewpoints began to change, and a lady, beautiful old lady named Dame Fina Cooper, she decided to organise a hikoi, or a walk down to Wellington. It was a protest march to say, we've got to look at this thing called the Treaty of Waitangi again, and consider what it would mean to honour it. And so they travelled down there singing hymns and praying karakia all of the way. And it got the attention of the public. In 1975, a government therefore decided to begin to address ongoing issues of injustice related to Māori land. In 1985, they made a courageous decision and they established the Waitangi Tribunal as we know it today to investigate injustices against Māori dating right back to the year that the treaty was signed. And can you remember what year that was? It was 1840. And so what's happened in our recent history is actually an honourable story. It's a fantastic story on a global scale. Whoever decides to honour an agreement that's 140 years old, that had been uh, broken, betrayed and pretty much forgotten? Well, New Zealand does. Because of the values of charity and love and compassion and honesty and integrity that we had embraced from our religious heritage, we looked at it and said what we did in history was wrong. And it takes courage to do that. And it's something that every one of us can be proud of. Our nation has been gradually addressing the injustices. A small amount of money, it might sound like a lot, giving $100 million to a, to a Māori tribe, but it's actually a very small amount of money in comparison to what was taken. And this is given as a token of apology, as the Crown, the government, on behalf of all New Zealanders, says what we did in history was wrong, and we apologise. And Māori, in their grace, are accepting those apologies. And they are receiving the monies that are being given to them, even though they are small in comparison to what is being taken. And something of a reconciliation is taking place. To summarise the chapters, you have Cook through to an invitation from Māori to missionaries. The whalers, sealers and traders have arrived. Uh, the missionaries establish trusting relationship. Then the next chapter, Māori embrace the Christian message and spread it themselves. It leads to big changes in the way that Māori behave and relate to one another. In the next chapter, Māori then create Te Wakaminenga, the Confederation of Chiefs, who establish E Whakaputanga, the Declaration of Independence. They are now declaring themselves one nation. In England, Christian activists trying to change the world fight slavery. They decide to try and stop colonisation. Those two groups come together through Hobson. And that results in Tatiriti or Waitangi, the Treaty of Waitangi. An amazing agreement appointing one government over all of us, but the Māori would be protected in terms of their land, their villages and their treasures and be equal citizens. Articles 2 and 3 were terribly betrayed. Māori lost the vast majority of all things they had and suffered emotionally as a people as a result. But the last chapter, our nation had the courage to address this again. To dig that treaty back out, uh, in fact it was a guy, Lord Bledisloe, who owned the land, which is now the treaty grounds, and gifted it back to the government saying this land's important and one day this place will be on it. And today that truly is the case. To go back to the stage illustration and we're done. The first on the stage is who? That's the Māori, the tangata whenua, the people of the land. The next two on the stage were the whalers, sealers and traders. They were there for money. The next on the stage were the missionaries, and they were next to Māori because they desired to help. Not everything they did was perfect, but they were there to help, and they certainly made a massive difference, more so than any other person who arrived. The next on the stage were the settlers. They were there for a better life. No real concern for Māori. And the next on the stage was the colonial office. The British government coming in, walking around the stage, with power to decide what would happen. Because of the missionaries, they got right next to Māori and we have the Treaty of Waitangi, Te Tiriti or Waitangi. But the heart of the Crown shifted to support the settlers. The treaty was betrayed. In our day, the heart of the Crown is returning. I hope this illustration and talk has been useful and will give you some context for the discussions and the things uh, that you will talk about and read in your classrooms. All the very best. <laughs>